I think he lost his, his rag a bit more at the start. He wanted to get his points across and, and obviously using your voice and screaming at people is a great way to do that. Really have to get back to the hotel here. Like th this tornado is going to hit us in like 10 minutes. We have to get out. He said, no, we're not going until we get it right. And he said, do you want to play left back or right back? And his English wasn't amazing at the time. And I said to him, I think my answer was, uh, that's like asking me which one of these two guys do you want to spend a night with your missus? <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Stelling and this is Football's Greatest. Each week I'll be sitting down with a legend to discuss and debate some of the best exponents of the beautiful game. The players that got you off your seat, the hard men that made you wince, and the moments that will stay with you for life. Now today's guest has won the Champions League, the Premier League on three occasions, the FA Cup, the League Cup, as well as over 60 England caps in a career spanning more than 20 years at the highest level. James Milner joins us to talk about the greatest managers from that career. James, thanks for joining us. No problem. You'd have taken that CV when you were 16, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Obviously, at that point, you're just trying to uh, get into the team, aren't you? So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's been... Uh, a, a great ride up till now and how fast it's gone. I always remember Nigel Martin when I was 16 saying, enjoy it, it'll it'll go before you know it. And he was probably my age when he said that to me. And uh, yeah, it has gone so quick. Yeah. Do you remember the debut? Yeah, West Ham uh, away, yeah. Um, I'd been on the uh, in the squad a few times and, and not been on the bench and stuff. And then West Ham away, we were leading comfortably, I think. And I thought, I'm definitely getting on now. And then it got closer and closer and it ended up being 4-3 at the time. And I thought, oh, he's not going to put me on. And he did, he stuck me on. And I think um, my first touch was to pass it straight to De Canio, who luckily enough put it over the bar. But um, yeah, it was uh, when you see videos now and how big the shirt was when you're coming on and things like that and how young I was. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing, really. So, I mean, here we are at Brighton now. Are you surprised to find yourself here? Um, yes and no. I think only yes, because it's a lot further south than I've been before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm loving it, to be honest. I think, you know, just it was, it was time to move on from Liverpool and, and that came to a natural end. And looking at the journey Brighton have been on, and um, you know the football to play, the man, the job the manager's done. Obviously, being close with Adam Lallana and hearing a lot of good things from them, and and seeing them play and having to play against them, knew what a strong team they were. Um, and obviously, the fact they're in Europe as well is an absolute bonus. You want to play at the highest level as, as much as you can, and it just felt like a right fit in terms of where the club was at his journey, where my experience and, and playing in Europe and things, how I could help, and and being a bit older, not scared to say things where you think things could be improved or things like give opinions and, and things like that and um, I think that's important and, and, and a role for me as well that I can help help the boys here as well. Mm. Um, how big an influence is your perception of a manager when you move? Because obviously the manager at we see when, when you went to Newcastle, Bobby Robson, you, you know, um, fantastic man, great manager, but he was gone almost as soon as you arrived. So do you look at Roberto De Zerbi, for instance, and, and think, yeah, he's one of the reasons I moved to Brighton. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, the job he's done since he's come in, the sort of personality is speaking to him before I signed. Um, like I said, I've been a bit, or him or me, have been a bit luckier this time around than Sir Bobby when, unfortunately, yeah. he got sat pretty quick. And that was a theme early on in my career. I think I didn't start and finish the season with the same manager until Martin O'Neill, which was probably five or six seasons into my career. So, yeah, he's, ov he's obviously top and, and how he's got the team playing and, the energy he shows and his personality, um, you know, he's desperate to do well. People say he's got ideas that are very different. I, I always thought there must be a, a finite number of ideas that you can have as a football manager. So so what does he do that's different? Yeah, I think he's very specific how he plays. He's got an idea how to play, but obviously we play in different ways. But a lot of his work we do is with the ball. He wants to play in a, in a good style, an exciting style, and he wants to dominate games with the ball. And I think that's... Uh, nice for the fans to see that it's nice for players players want to always play with the ball obviously there's always the other side to to the game as well which um, but you know people want to have the ball at the feet and, and, and play together and uh, yeah I think it was a great opportunity for me to, to come here when I've been fortunate enough to work for some major, amazing managers in my career and obviously working with Jürgen for so long yeah. and then coming here and, and getting a chance to learn again you're always learning and and Obviously, when you've worked somewhere for so long under a certain manager, you get used to that style of play and how he wants things done and then having to open your eyes and, and learn a new style. Um, 
it's exciting and and it and it's great and um like say you always want to expand your horizons and your, and your thoughts around football and different ways to do it and um you know make make your knowledge even even better mm. Is he the sort of manager that you can talk to? Will he listen to you? Yeah, when he understands me, I think the your tracks and makes it a bit difficult at times. But yeah, he is for sure. He's um, yeah, he's, he's he's very good at that. He'll pull players aside. He'll, he'll try give them the exact detail what he wants. And if there's off the field things as well, he's very open and 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 wants to look after his players as long as you're hundred percent on it. As you turn up for training, if you turn up for the meetings and you're concentrated, as long as you're giving him hundred percent and you're fully switched on. Yeah, he, he's he's brilliant, and he doesn't mind all the other side. Yeah, well, my Brighton supporting son absolutely adores him. So yeah. he's helped you get into the record books as well when you won at Old Trafford this season. First player to win at Old Trafford with four different teams. Yeah, it's not a bad record to have no. for a Leeds lad uh, yeah. growing up, <laughs> and uh, obviously been big rivals. So yeah, um, mm. that's one that I think probably my dad and my uncle are particularly proud of it. <laughs> he enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, how does he, can you compare him with Jurgen Klopp? Are there any similarities? Yeah, I think there are in terms of their emotion and the, and the, the show it on the sideline and the show that they're into the game and the bouncing round and uh, on, on the touchline. And um, I think there's similarities in that. Um, and, y y you know, I'm, Hopefully, um, the manager's here for for a while yet, but it wouldn't surprise you if he, he he takes on a job of a, you know, that next step again going forward. But you know, the job is done here so far, and there's plenty to accomplish here and taking us into Europe and hopefully carry on with that. Um, you know, his, his standards are so high, and he's always pushing everyone, and that's where it starts for the, for the whole club. You know, obviously the owner's done an amazing job and in, in, in on the journey taking it to here, and the manager's helping drive that. And, and and pushing people's expectations and you know it's important that we try to change that that this isn't our first season in Europe let's enjoy it it's, this is our first season in Europe make sure it's not the last or it, let's try and make this a normal thing and, and we want to push for Europe and, yeah. and and that comes from the manager that mindset let's go back to Liverpool then um because Brendan Rodgers brought you in but then I mean, very soon Jurgen Klopp came in, didn't he, with his, um, I think the quote was something about, you know, we play heavy metal football. Um, so so what was that like? Was it a bit of a, a culture shock, the change between Brendan and Jurgen Klopp? Yeah, I mean, Brendan, again, like Sir Bobby, is unfortunate not to work with him for longer. Great coach, great manager, liked him a lot for the short time I was with him. And then obviously Jurgen comes in and uh, we didn't play a slow style under Brendan particularly. It was just, you know, the, the personality of the manager and the level he wanted. I remember the first game, I think it was Spurs away and the tempo of the game was just like out of this world. Like both teams were going at it and the level and everything was just 100% what we were doing, flying around the training was was a lot longer, a lot harder. We had a lot of injuries early on while players adapted to it and things like that. Um, but he had to get what his expectations were down early and it was a big change quick and, you know, we're unfortunate not to win a trophy that first year. But he obviously saw the bigger picture and said, you know, let's not be disappointed. This is just a start. And, um, yeah, it was a, a change that the players had to get on board with quick. And, like again, it was tough doing it in the season. But that first season, you know, we got to two finals, didn't we? And, and didn't quite get over the line. But that made us hungry for more. And then it was nice to see that journey, how that that, that unfolded going forward. Yeah. Did did, um, did Jürgen Mello change at all in the time that you were there? Yeah, he did. He did. I think at the start, for sure, um, not many days off. Um a lot longer and harder training at times and 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 things like that um and then i think to his credit you know obviously germany was a lot different they have the winter break and things like that it was two sprints whereas england christmas is the busiest period and things like that and i think he he learned to trust the team as well i think he had ideas about players and maybe english players as well you know like to drink a lot don't prepare well and and things like this and i think he saw the squad he had that it wasn't like that and if players got a day off they'd look after themselves and do the right things and to his credit he he, he changed things uh, and softened as time went on um, but never lost his edge and um, yeah he was definitely more aggressive at the start I'd say as well I think he lost his his rag a bit um, more at the start and I think again that's setting the standards it's probably the players he had wasn't his squad I think um, he wanted to get his points across and you know, you surprise people into making sure that they're doing the job and making things second nature. Reactions and all the training was about reacting to the next situation 
we've got the ball, we lose the ball, can we go win it back immediately? And obviously using your voice and screaming at people is a great way to do that because, you know, that's, it shocks you into doing it. And then that filtered into the boys and the boys were pushing each other then and things like that. And you just see how it developed and the culture he created. Well, he had a lot of faith in you, that's for sure, didn't he? W was he the one who turned you from a sort of out-and-out, out, well, not so much a winger by then, but midfield player into a fullback? Was he the first one? Yeah, so the first time was we played, I think, United in the Europa League. And someone had a fitness test the day of the game. We're training at Carrington, actually, which was Man City's old training ground. Yeah. And uh, I remember we were having the conversation and he um, pulled me to the side and whoever it was hadn't made it. And it was me and Kleine, I think, playing. He said, do you want to play left back or right back? And his English wasn't amazing at the time. And I said to him, I think my answer was, uh, that's like asking me which one of these two guys do you want to spend a night with your missus? <laughs> and uh, he pulled sort of face and I was like, well, I'll play left back because it's pointless two of us playing out of position. And I probably prefer left back to right back anyway. And, and that was the first time and I did an okay job. And then the start of, that was obviously, I don't know, after Christmas, if it was the knockout stage of the Europa and then... I don't think I played it again that year. And then pre-season, we're away and he pulled me into his office uh, on tour and he said, um, I, I want to play your left back this year. What are your thoughts on that? And obviously, he's had time to think about it. It's put on my toes and I'm thinking, well, what do I do here? I don't really want to play there, but do I want to be a part of this? And it's my decision. I can turn around and say no. And the likelihood is I'll leave Liverpool or yes, I'll do it. And, you know, my approach has always been do whatever you can for the team if that's what's needed now. And obviously, he's a special manager at special football club and how he wanted to play it. So I said, yeah, and went out to train the first day. I remember a few of the boys' faces when we were doing the shape or whatever, and I was left back, like, what's going on here? And, and, and that was the start of it, yeah. So what do you see yourself as now? Whatever's needed, I think, yeah. I think, like I say, as you get older... I mean, the team's always come first. I've, I've played the game and my belief, that that's 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 no question of that. Um, but at times in your career, you might make decisions like, let me say in that sliding doors moment, if you like, if I turn around and say, no, I don't want to play there. I, I came here to play a bit more in the midfield, which I believe has been my best position. But I think, you know, that you, you, you just do what's best for the team and... and, and you know, I, I think we had a successful season there. And yeah, I, I, like I said, you, you think more about the team. So it's less about decisions for yourself and how can you impact on that. And that's what's wherever the manager asks you to play, you play. So I find myself right back and left back this year so far. We'll see what happens there as well. But I, I knew that coming to Brighton, my, my mindset was I just want to help the team and the club in, in, in whatever way I can and off the, off the field. And, and uh, that's what hopefully I can do. Well, I, I saw a newspaper headline in your times in Liverpool, describing you as Liverpool's Mr. Everything, which is a brilliant accolade, isn't it? Yeah, and I th I th like you say, I think what I've been lucky enough to be part of at Liverpool in, in the time I was there and what we experienced. And, um, you know, I had that season at left back and I always joke, I made Andy Robertson's career because of how good he looks now because of how bad I was before he, he started playing there. So we always joke about that. That was a big assist. But um, Well, I'm not so sure about that because Andy Robertson went off, didn't he, in that um, Champions League semi-final second leg against Barcelona to leave you up against Messi. Yeah, that, that was, was pretty much the case, wasn't yeah. it? You know? <laughs> yeah, and you won 4-0, so I think you can always yeah. mention it to him. No, yeah, that was, that was a special night, obviously. But yeah. Um, yeah, I remember the year after then and it was one of those, I think I was at, like we had six or seven midfielders and I started the back of the queue and just had to fight and dig in and managed to fight my way back in and around that midfield position and I think that was the year I set the record for most Champions League assists in the season so that was nice as well which you, you have to do as a player you have those times when I was at Man City we signed players for big money every year and you go to the back of the queue and you have to stick in there and fight again so um, yeah you look at your career all the way through and you think oh this, this manager's changing like every year that could have been very difficult for me in my career or you know the Man City and players coming in you could fall on the wayside there if you don't take your chances and then if I don't say to the manager I'll play left back and then you don't fight your way into the midfield the year after you look at all these parts of your career and you, you feel fortunate as well but also feel proud that when you've had your chance you've managed to take it and, and, and stick in there Now thanks for watching Football's Greatest on YouTube but can I ask you please to hit that subscribe button that way you won't miss any of our future episodes and we have some great guests coming up on the show so I, mean, I know when you mentioned Man City, obviously you won trophies at, at Manchester City, but, but it, did it ultimately become a, a bit frustrating because you weren't sure you were going to start? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think guess you're never sure you're going to start. But. No, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it, it was that. And it was just, 
I was I was there five years, and it come to a point where we were due for contract negotiations, and um, you know the club um, didn't come back for a long time, and and then it was just one of those where my contract got low enough that you start thinking about options and adoptions, and and that was the way it went. I love my time at City, and like you say, I've been fortunate enough to win trophies there, and yeah, could have easily seen myself staying there, but um, Liverpool came up, and and. It was just a decision to make and uh, it, it turned out well in the end. Um, obviously, when you were at City, um, two big name managers, you know, in Roberto Mancini and, and Manuel Pellegrini, uh, were, were they very different characters? Very, very, very different characters, yeah. One again, quite emotional. Um, flew off the handle pretty quickly. And obviously, uh, the other one, pretty calm, very calculated, trained very different ways, defended in different ways. And and again, like you feel lucky that you've worked under these different styles and 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 uh and and learned along the way of how I did it. But yeah, it was the two very different characters in my time though. It was rather that you preferred playing under? Yeah. For um yeah, I think so. I think one one probably preferred to the other, but you don't want to say you know. <laughs> <laughs> would you? I tell you, you, you know, let's play a bit of fantasy football. Would you like to have played under Pep? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think obviously how he plays is he's, he's very intense as well, and um, you know, tactically does things very differently at times, and you know, probably a bit similar to the manager how he, how he changes it, and um, you know, you look at Pep what he's done in, in his career and the club clubs he's been at and at City as well, and. You know, even what the stops was doing, I think, would we get 90 points, over 90 points three times and only one league title, lost a league title with 97 points. I mean, yeah. it's, it's pretty ludicrous, really. But again, that shows what a job he's done there and how good Man City were as well. So, um, you know, the fact we challenged them for, for for those years and pushed them and managed to nick a league title off them and put them out of the Champions League, that was, that, that was big and made bigger by how good they, they were and the job Pep did there and... Um, yeah, for sure. That was. I think there was a season in between me leaving and him uh, coming in. But yeah, I think obviously he's a top manager. Yeah, I know he's a bandit on the golf course. Is he? Well, I played in a golf tournament with him, and then I can't remember what handicap he was playing off. But I think he held out from twice from fifty yards or something. So he's uh, he's definitely better than he was saying he was. Right. Yeah. He's probably one of these guys who's good at everything. Yeah, you know? I'm sure, so, yeah. yeah. What do you play off? Uh, six. Okay, so you're one of these guys who's good at everything as well. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I think he could have handled it differently, I think, on, on the day it come out. I think we were in the bus and he pulled me down to the front of the bus and everyone was still there and he just said, oh, I was misquoted or whatever. I felt like he could have dealt with it a bit better. But every time I got left out of the team at Newcastle, I mean, that was a time where the manager had changed. There was a younger player and you're not always playing. And it just the only way I knew how to deal with that is work harder, work harder in the gym, run around more in training, do extras after training. That that, that would have just drove me on to, to, to push harder. Could you ever see a day when we went back to the game without VAR? <sighs> Probably not. Um... I would like it, but no, probably not. Look, let's turn the clock right back. So when you were starting out and, and you're at Leeds, uh, and I think it was Terry Venables was in charge yeah. then, wasn't he? Yeah. You know, and, and it was quite bold of him putting you on, wasn't it? Because he was under pressure. Yeah, it, 100%, like you say, in that game as well. And it, it, we, we nicked it 4-3 and played a few games after that. And again, like there's sliding doors, and I feel like I think it was a game at Spurs. I'd, I'd been involved a few games, and then um, we trained before we travelled on the Saturday. And he pulled me in his office. He said, "You're not travelling this week. You haven't done anything wrong, but um, you know, just don't want to put you in too much and expose you too much. So we, we're going to stay at home." Oh, it was before training, I think. So we went out to train. Mm. Someone got injured in training, so I ended up travelling. Wasn't on the bench. Someone got injured in the warm up got on the bench and then came on and did all right in the game. I can't remember if I assisted or I did all right. And then from that point, I was in the squad every game, managed to score the 26th uh, of December and the 28th. And then from that moment on, that, that was it, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's weird how, again, you have those little things that happen and you think this so, could so easily have been at home watching them against Spurs and these little things Because that was happen. your boyhood club, yeah? Yeah, yeah. remember... My first game was, I think, when Leeds won the Youth Cup against Man United. I think it was at 91. It was at a, a sold-out Ellen Road, stood on the cop. And then I remember Leeds winning the league title. And my dad 
jumping around the living room with me in his arms saying, enjoy this, it might never happen again in your lifetime. And uh, unfortunately, it's been right up to this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then from that point, we had a season ticket and signed for the academy when I was ten. But look, you, I mean, you left Leeds, and it was sort of a decision that was made for you, wasn't it? Yeah, it's so weird. I mean, thinking about the transfers and how things work in the rest of my career, it's so weird what actually happened now when I think about it. I mean, we got relegated, gone away for the summer, or whatever. Come back first day of pre-season, and I think we were talking about a new contract or whatever, and I was fully expecting it to stay reported for the first day of pre-season and said, oh, you're going up to Newcastle tomorrow for your medical. And that was the first I knew of it. So I don't, it, it's it's crazy thinking about it now. Did the first day of training there and then went up to Newcastle and signed for them. And it was painted as it's the best thing for the best, in, best interest of the club. Obviously, there was financial problems at the time. The money they would get from the transfer would help the team. Um gave up what little money I was owed and 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 that was that, yeah. Amazing. So no choice at all. Yeah, you couldn't see it happening in this day and age, no, could you? Yeah. you know? and, uh, the fact that I didn't know anything about it before that, obviously, the, yeah. the grumblings and rumours, things now, and even the player. Um, yeah, it's, it's strange how that happened, but yeah, that that was the case. Yeah. And, and you regarded Sir Bobby as a bit of a mentor, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I didn't get much chance to work with him for too yeah. long, but just watching him work, his enthusiasm for the game, his age, I loved it. Um, everybody loved him. Um, just the little things he did with the after training, he'd pull you to the side and uh, he'd set up patterns of play that you'd have in your area of the pitch. So as a winger, he'd, he'd balls would come into you and he'd get other players in and say, this is a pitch you're likely to see, knock it around the corner, follow it. And just his enthusiasm for the, for the game, it was incredible. I remember we went um, pre-season tour to the Far East and um, there was a weather warning for like uh, a tornado to hit or whatever. And we're training. Pitch is absolutely saturated, like rain siling it down. And we're doing this crossing and finishing drill where the ball starts on the halfway line, goes wide, cross and finish. And um, he was going mad because we couldn't get it right. The ball wouldn't roll. So we're literally having to keep it in the air from drilling a 30-yard pass. One guy keeps it out wide, keeps it in the air. The other guy volleys it in and someone has to head it or, uh, or put it in. And the guy's saying... So Bobby, we really have to get back to the hotel here. Like this tornado is going to hit us in like 10 minutes. We have to get like, No, we're not going until we get it right. We've got to get it right. Anyway, we got it right and got back to the hotel and we're up on the 40th floor or something in the medical room waiting for this thing to hit. And obviously how busy the streets are out there. And then you just saw the streets go like deadly calm and everyone obviously going inside. And, and then we were lucky, I think it about a mile down the, the coast, but it was just like, it's attention to do. It's like, we're not going until, I don't care if this hits us. Until we get this right, we're not going anywhere. Yeah, I mean, he lived and breathed football, didn't he? He was, um, he, you know, from my knowledge of him, just just an amazing man. And I remember when he was sacked, how shocked we were. How shocked were you? Yeah, for sure. I think, did we draw at Villa, I think? We drew away at Villa, I think it was. Um, yeah, and it, it was a shock. And I think until probably recently, the team's probably never been in the position they were in at that point when they sacked him until very yeah. in like the last year, really. So it, it, it's tough, obviously, and um, when a team's been that successful and they're that close and they feel like they were knocking on the door for league titles and playing in the Champions League and you want to make that next step. And sometimes, you know, teams think it's the right thing to do that. And obviously hindsight's the easiest thing to look at and say, yeah, it wasn't, but... Um, yeah, it was a shame I didn't get to like work with him longer, but yeah. I've so many stories and felt like I worked with him for a lot longer for the stories that you were told when you arrived and and for the years after playing there. And I remember when this happened with Sir Bobby and yeah. it probably feels like I played for him for two or three years just from all the stories I heard in the time. Yeah. So. I, I remember when he was sacked, you know, that week on on Soccer Saturday on Sky, we asked if he, he would do a live interview. And I thought, well, there's no chance. There's no chance that he'll do it. But he's such an amenable guy that that he did. He came on live that Saturday, the first Saturday after he'd been sacked and and, and he was upset, um, you know, slightly angry. But uh, as he always was, he was so gracious. He didn't want to point the finger, you know, at, at people. And um, I'll, I'll never forget that interview. I mean, he's such a wonderful man. And then along came, you've been asked this a thousand times, I know. Along came Graham Souness, yeah. uh, who's famously quoted as saying, you'll never win anything with a team of James Milners. Right. That must have hurt. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Um, and I think, 
I mean, it's funny because like, I have zero problems with him. I, I, I yeah. really like listening to him. You know, I've got, I have no problems. When we won the league title, um, the first time at City, he was he was there and he come over and congratulated me. And, and there's no problems at all. So I, I don't mind saying anything about it because I have so much respect for him. And I think he could have handled it differently. I think on on the day it come out, I think we were in the bus and he pulled me down to the front of the bus. And everyone was still there and he just said, oh, I was misquoted or whatever. I felt like he could have dealt with it a bit better. But, you know, he, he was obviously an experienced manager and he, he made a comment about want, needing more experienced players. And, you know, as, as the media like to do at times, to spun it in that way. But for me, in terms of looking back now, again, it's another big moment. How I've always taken things in my career, you know, people, whether it rated me or not, I don't think that was a question. It was just he wanted experience. But you're going to have times in your career people don't rate you. You're going to get criticism. You're going to have bad games. You're going to have you know headlines like that and it's how do you use that do you shy away from it or do you use it as fuel do you use it to drive you on do you use it like like my dad used to do when you can say all right i'll show you and um yeah managed to win a few trophies since then so yeah so, so it made you dig deeper did it i think uh, it was if always was the possible. same yeah, yeah yeah i mean every time i got left out of the team at newcastle i mean that was a time where the manager had changed there was a younger player and you're not always playing and it just the only way I knew how to deal with that is work harder, work harder in the gym, run around more in training, do extras after training, and, and that was that was the only way I ever knew how to deal things. Work work harder again, and um, yeah, that 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 would have just drove me on to to, to push harder. Mm. I, and then we we talked about the number of managers. I think you had Glenn Roder came in there, didn't he? And Big Sam, you were still there when Big, Big Sam, Sam was there, weren't you? Yeah, Kevin Keegan was the manager when I left. All right. Yeah, so. You did have a period of uh, stability after that, didn't you? At, at Villa with, with Martin O'Neill. Yeah. Um, and he turned you into a bit of a goal scorer as well. Yeah, I loved my time at Villa. How we played, uh, exciting football. Martin, I'd say, um, great man manager. Um didn't we never did too much work tactically, but he, he knew how to get the best out of his players. Um, Was there a bit of the Brian Clough about him then? Yeah, I think so for sure. Like you, you could win a game and he'd say, "I'll see you Thursday," and you didn't play well, and you come in and you're running and and nothing set. It'd just be a go around that goal and back in, and he just all through feel and visual in in 22 seconds. And if people aren't running hard enough, we'll do it again. And just just felt what the mood was like, felt what was needed. Um, made you feel like the best player in the world. Um, yeah, I went in there and, and, and started on the wing, and then I think Gaz left, and there was a chance in the middle, put me in the middle, and yeah, uh, managed to get forward there, used my engine, played in there with Stan, and, and, and we had a great team. Unfortunately, not to win a, a, a trophy and close to being in the top four. A bit more luck, a few more bodies, maybe. I think we played 60 odd games that year with the Europa, and the, I think we got to the League Cup final and the FA Cup semi final, so the workload was high. and um, yeah, lo loved every minute, and him and his staff were, were brilliant to work with, and definitely gave you the confidence uh, uh, as a player. Yeah, and England, of course, came along, didn't it? What was that, two thousand and nine? Yeah, that was my debut. Yeah, I played a lot of twenty ones games, obviously, and the, quite a few times where I was close to getting in the senior team. And you know, I think it was between me and someone else, and they couldn't play twenty ones, so I'd be putting the twenty ones, and they'd play in the seniors. And yeah, it, it was one of those that I think when I made my debut. I think Stuart Pearce had been the 21s coach, but it was with the first team at that time. And when the manager said he was going to put me on, he said, quick, get your tracky off before it changes his mind, sort of thing, because he knew it had been a long time coming. And I think we were 2-0 down in, uh, um, in Holland, actually, and, and we managed to come back and draw two all. So that, that was good. Uh, yeah, and you're going to be modest by not saying you laid on the equaliser for Jermaine Defoe. Yeah, I think I nearly got stitches for him actually for that one. I got kicked in the head, I think. But uh, yeah, it, it was brilliant to, to come on and, and make an impact. It was great, yeah. Yeah, you, you got lots of good press the next day. You was reading some of the reports, you know, you know, fine debut, exciting talent and and all of this stuff, which was, was great. What was Capello like? Yeah, he, he was good. He was uh, very strict, knew what he wanted. Um, again, another manager who could... Uh, flip his lid very very quickly not to 100 in in a short period of time but uh, again he had players knowing what he wanted and they knew that if they didn't do what was expected that they'd, they'd be told in in uh in uncertain terms so yeah um and enjoy my time there obviously he gave me my debut and 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 and, and took me to a, a World Cup, so you'll always be grateful for that. Yeah, because I think at the time he sort of divided opinion, didn't he? I remember there were lots of stories around at the time about he wouldn't allow dining room cliques and, and little things like that. Was that the case? Was he fastidious, if you like? 
Um, yeah, I think he had a lot of rules of stuff about not wearing flip flops and you know no no ketchup, which I think annoyed a few of the boys and things like this. And and it, um, he wasn't scared to make changes. Obviously, it was the England dressing room. I came into the, a lot of massive personalities, a lot of superstars in there, and you know they were used to doing things a certain way in the clubs and things like that. And I think he wasn't obviously scared to say no to them uh, at times. And you know players don't always like change. So I think obviously ones who uh, maybe weren't in the team and stuff. Maybe wouldn't have been too happy about it. But yeah, I think he he was definitely not scared of of making his own decision, even if the players didn't like it. Yeah, I think your other England manager was was obviously Roy Hodgson, who um, a bit like your, yourself in playing terms is evergreen, still going strong now, isn't he? Um, what, what was it like to play for Roy? Yeah, Roy coming obviously completely different to to uh, Fabio and um, played in a different way and. Um, a lot of shape work, remember, and you know, played played in the first couple of tournaments with Roy, and then after that, didn't play as as much after that. And um, yeah, I, mean, I think it wasn't a period that you look at the team, how well the team are doing now. It was a period where things wasn't going too well, and you know, the the, the superstars that we had were were getting a bit older, and and the squad was changing. And I don't think it was an overly easy time of that transition going from one team to another sort of thing. Um, but. Yeah, it was disappointing how how the the tournaments went and things like that. But yeah, that, that that's football. It doesn't always go the way you want. Yeah, could anyone get a word in edgeways because you had Gary Neville as the assistant? So no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think Gaz was uh, calling the shots a lot of the time for sure. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think you you retired from international football didn't you, two thousand and sixteen. So what seven years? Any regrets? Did you think in retrospect maybe it was a little too soon? No, not really. I think um, Sam was manager and I, I spoke to him. He came around to my house. I'd worked with him at Newcastle and obviously I haven't played too much under Roy um, the last the, the, the last year. Um, I'd been playing well for Liverpool and I spoke to him and just said, uh, you know, I didn't need a show he was going to play, but just you get a feeling for the manager what he's thinking. Am I going to be involved? And, you know, he said, I didn't know what was going to happen, but it wasn't overly, you know, I'm desperate for you. So I was like, Do you know what? I think it's it, it's time to call it a day. Did that. And we always had this thing with Jürgen at the time and uh, we'd come back from international duty and you'd always be in the day after. And it was like, Gaffer, any chance of a day off? We just went away with England. It was like, if you want days off, retire. <laughs> so it's like, all right. <laughs> so the next international break, um, the England manager changed. And Jürgen, to his word, after the first one, uh, he gave us the week off. So I'd booked to go away. And I'm, I think I was on the way to the airport and Gareth rang me and said, will you reconsider? You know, it'd be great to have you. And that, that was tough decision because if he'd have said he was managing what he'd said when I made the decision to retire I'd have probably said yeah for sure I'll stay on but at that point there'd been a camp there'd have been a game I'd retired and I just didn't think it was the right thing I'd committed to that and and I think that was the the, the right decision to make once you've made a decision com commit to it but I do feel if he'd have said to me what he said and he'd have been the manager at the time and nothing against Sam obviously it was just how Sam put the message across I didn't feel like you know I would have been that big a part whereas Gareth was like really need your experience and and, and a few other things um, I think I probably maybe would have played a bit longer but uh, again it's just how it's how it panned out and although you know I was a 29-30 I think you look at what I've managed to achieve since that um, it's definitely obviously helped me I, I would think for sure and helped me stay at the level I have been at I do hope you're enjoying the show I just want to tell you that you can follow us at at football's greatest pod on Instagram TikTok and Facebook and search for football's greatest pod to find us on X I mean you work for so many great managers and I know you, you take things from each of them so it, is it in your mind that that's what you'll do you'll go on and be a manager uh, my mind changes a lot on this. I think um, you know, you see, you see how fast managers change at times, and not really getting the chance they should. You think how much effort and time it takes to change a team from playing one style to another. A few transfer windows, playing coming in and players coming in and out, and and a style of play needing to take. And it's so difficult. Obviously, the amount of games I played and stuff. It, it, you you don't think managers get as much time as 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 they should. Um, at, at times so you look at that and you're like mm, not sure on that but then also like you say I've been very fortunate to play for some amazing managers play with some incredible players um, feel like I've learned a lot and it'd be a shame to not use that um, but after 
was it 22 seasons in the Premier League up to now, I think I definitely need a bit of a break <laughs> at first and just, um, you know, see the kids and the, the missus a bit more than I have for the last uh, however many years. Yeah. So I mentioned at the start, you know, 22 seasons in the Premier League and a, a lot's changed over that time, hasn't it? You know, in which ways do you, do you think the game has changed for the better? The, the speed of the game's obviously got quicker, I, I think. And people I, will say you can't tackle now. Yeah, yeah. I th it's, it's a tough one. I think I'd like to see a bit more contact in the game, personally. Um, but keeping out, you know, everybody who knows football and has played football, you can see a tackle where someone's gone in to hurt someone and you can see that. So those fair tackles where there is a bit of... You know, a bit of strength in there, but you know he's gone in for the ball and he's not left the ground or anything like that. I think that's that's that'd be nice to keep a, a, a bit of that. I think VR is obviously a, a big change, and I'm not personally a massive fan. Uh, if I'm if I'm honest, um, I feel like if you look back at some of the moments like the Aguero goal, and imagine if you'd have had a VR check on that and things like that. I feel like we were joking around with Dunkey the other day. He scored an, an amazing goal at Everton, and uh, we were joking saying, "Did you feel a bit of a wally after you celebrated? Because like you celebrated like that, and your goal wasn't given, and things like that." But it's it, it's one of those. Does it take the emotion out of the game? Um, but I, I know why it's there and it's so hard, but we seem to be having as many conversations now about it every week as, as we were before decisions. And, you know, before VR, you could turn around and say, well, he's got a split second to make his decision. So that's obviously a big change. Could you ever see a day when we went back to the game without VAR? <sighs> probably not. Um, I would like it, but no, probably not. I said that you'd like it. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, your camera, <laughs> I'd like it as well. Yeah. You know, when you see those, you know, the three checks on the Newcastle goal against Arsenal, and you just think this, this is crazy. This can't be. And right. I feel like the referees feel under more pressure to get the decision a hundred. Mm. Like obviously they want to get every decision right, but in a split second with an offside and things like that, it's hard to see. Mm. Um, and you can expect mistakes, but now I think they're held to a higher level because they've got video and things. I, I'd just like it to be a bit quicker, I think. If, yeah. if it's here to stay, it'd be like, if you can look at it immediately and say it's wrong, then brilliant. But if you have to look four times, it's not obvious. So uh, leave the on-field decision. Yeah, it's hard not to compare, isn't it, with, with like the championship, where if somebody scores a goal, it's a quick look at the, the lines assistant. Of it, yeah. You know, if the flag's down, celebrate, yeah, off you go, and you know you've yeah. scored. It's, yeah. uh, it's a different world, really. So what, what are the targets for you now? I mean, people will look at the number of Premier League games you've played. You, you got Gareth Barry's record on your mind, or is that not the way you think? Well, only because every interview I do, I get asked about as well oh, as right. that and what I'm doing after. But um, I think it's one of those. It's never really something that I've like. That's what I'm after. You know, it's, it's still a long way around uh, way to be honest. And the, the, you never know what happens in football. But um, it is one of those that it's that many games. Um, it's like kind of if you can do it you, you may as well it would be a, a, a nice thing but it's one of those you think about after your career to be honest and I, I'm still hoping to contribute as much as I can to Brighton I want to push as hard as I can and, and keep helping uh, the team as much, much as possible and keep playing as much football because everyone you speak to all the all the players who've retired and all, all my mates who seem to be doing media now and, and all these things every time you look at the TV it's old teammates which obviously makes you feel older but they'll say <laughs> play as long as you can so um, for sure I, I feel good um, still to be playing at this level and hopefully I can keep contributing you, you've been in the same side as Gareth Barry haven't you and has he ever spoken to you and said oh, you know 653 you'll never get there no he's never said that I've played golf with him earlier this year I haven't seen him for a while um, since then but yeah he's not said that maybe if next time we play golf he starts sitting golf balls at me I'll know that he don't want me to get there yeah. Yeah, well you're going to know what the next question is then in that case is is um, if the record's not something that's on your mind what about how long you'll go on for I mean you've always had a reputation of being one of the fittest players in, in football and I look at you know exceptional cases admittedly but you know Teddy Sheringham playing when he was 42 um, Ryan Giggs playing when he was 40, you know, Kevin Phillips was, was, was playing when he was as 40 as well. Um, do, do you have a target? No, I don't have a number. I think it's how you feel and, and what you're doing. Are you at a club or at a place where you, you believe in what's going on? Do you, do, you, do you feel like you can contribute? Does it feel right? Do you still have the drive to do it? I think the 
the day the manager reads out the team sheet and you're not on it and you're not annoyed, I think that's the time to pack up and, you know, I'll still get a feel, I'll understand why if I've played too many games or rotation or you're not in his team. But if you lose that, you know, that burning desire of why are you not playing me tomorrow, I yeah. think that's the time to 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 give it up. But I'm loving my time here, the the the, the challenge of, of being here. I think those guys you said as well, it depends what role you're playing as well, obviously. There's not too many 37-year-old fullbacks playing in uh, certain games and um, in certain situations. Obviously, um, midfield is maybe a bit easier for that when you get older as well. Bodies around you, or obviously Teddy playing off yeah. off the front in the jam roll and, and pulling strings. It's a bit different. So um, yeah, I think it, it depends on your mentality. It depends on um, physically, obviously. Um, and depends on your situation of where you're playing and what team you're playing in and how they play. I think there's a lot of factors into it. But yeah, I haven't got a target. I think you just take it every game and enjoy every game you come come into. Is it my last Premier League game? Is it my last European game? You never know. So I'm just trying to enjoy it and take it in. And I, I felt that more towards the end of Liverpool and we won trophies and just taking things that you wouldn't think about before and watch the boys' reaction and how they, when we won the won the title and standing at the back of the room and watching the Chelsea game and watching everyone in front of me and how they were reacting that 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 was special and you wouldn't do that but I, I was fortunate enough to have done it before so I, I just wanted to enjoy it and when we won the cup at Wembley and watching the fans reaction when Costa scored the penalty and Costa had the ump with me because he thought I couldn't watch his penalty because he thought I had no faith in him but I wanted to watch the fans reaction yeah. when it went in and, and little things like that it's I've been lucky enough to be able to experience that you, you've played in front of some great sets of fans haven't you you know uh, 30 years ago almost to the week as we're sitting talking now Hartlepool beat Brighton by two goals to nil in what was then the old second, well, it was the old fourth division, I think it was, but yeah. two nil 30 years ago. And I thought at the time, there's only one side that's on the way up here. How wrong <laughs> could I be, you know? Um, it, it, there isn't a sort of old boys club, is there? When you, you go and play, I mean, for instance, against Everton, you know, you can put your arm around Ashley Young at the end and say, how are you feeling, mate? Yeah, yeah, we had a bit of a... I called him an old so and so at some point in the game. Actually, we had a bit of a laugh, obviously. But yeah, it's it's great to see Young is still out there and doing yeah what he was doing. He's changed a lot from when I played with him. I mean, he's a tri tricky winger. I mean, he's still got loads of ability, obviously. But how sharp he was and the balls he was whipping in the box at Villa and the goals he was scoring. He's still obviously got that quality, but you just you lose that yard, don't you? I hope you don't mind me asking this, but do your family appreciate the success that you've had? Do they? Do they realise, you know, what you've done over these past 22 years or are you just sort of dad to them and, and they take it a bit for granted? Um, yeah, I think the, the, the kids are a bit older now and my lad's football mad and he's at Liverpool Academy now and, and, and joining his football and... I think that is the nice thing that you are just dad. Obviously, my daughter doesn't really care about football. You know, you're just dad, and 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 that's nice. My lad's football mad now and wants to watch the highlights. And you know, he, I think he's since he's been watching you, know, the guy who comes off the bench or shows up the game or plays fullback and say, "Ah, oh, I used to have a step over in there, and I could like take it down the side and scored a few worldies in my time." I have to get YouTube up to remind him. But um, no, nah, I mean that's the nice thing I think, and that probably helps when you have kids. You know, it's there's one feeling you'll never miss when you retire and that's that feeling after not winning a game and losing a game and that feeling's horrendous um it, you lose 10 percent edge of that i suppose when you go home and see the kids and like you say you are just dad to them and they don't really care how the game is maybe my lad does a bit more now he's older but um yeah it's it that that changes things it would be nice to show them dad lifting one more trophy wouldn't it a european trophy maybe with brighton yeah, it'd be amazing. And I think that's the mentality we have to get into Brighton. Um, for sure that that is possible and that's the next step and um, that that's what the manager is desperate for and, and the club, I'm sure. But it's about getting that belief around the ground and, and, and around the club and that it, it can be done with the team we have. But that was definitely one of my best memories in football, I think, was winning the European Cup and having the kids on the pitch after and got a photo of standing standing uh, in the pitch and the kids are running around the, the, the European Cup. Uh, that 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 was amazing, and like I say, that's the 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 memories you share, and then you're going on the parades and things like that. That'd be amazing um, for a, a club like Brighton, the journey they've been on, and the amazing where that's gone on. Um, it'd be very difficult for sure. We know that, but um, 
you know, that that's what we want to aim for. And it's step by step, we'll, we'll try to work towards that. Uh, we're all rooting for you. Well, in the Stelling household, we are because, as I said, my son's a massive Brighton fan. Um, look, James, thanks very much indeed for, for spending time to, to talk over what, what's what been an absolutely amazing career. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And we've reached the end of Football's Greatest. My thanks to James Milner for joining us today. Don't forget to look out for part two with James when he reveals his top five games from his career. And he has plenty of choice, believe you me. It's, it's a big moment, really, for, for that team to to get over the line and win that if you don't it's, it's very tough to to pick yourselves up and go again got pulled off after what was it 25-30 minutes or something in the first game of the World Cup and you're thinking that's the only game I ever play in the World Cup going to be thinking about that for a pretty long time if you're watching on YouTube please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode of Football's Greatest and of course if you're listening to us on your favourite podcast platform please press follow so you get us in your feed every week. Thanks for joining us. Football's Greatest is a Folding Pocket production with BBC Studios.